Escobar has been killed. The cocaine kingpin has been a customer of a gangster known in South Florida simply as Tarzan. Tarzan had arranged to sell helicopters to the Colombians for whatever use their criminal activities required. Escobar wanted helicopters that would allow him to transport drugs within Colombia. He wanted better helicopters than the Colombian National Police or the military. So it was very, very beneficial to the Medellin cartel and other Colombian drug lords. The Soviet gunships weren't enough to save Pablo Escobar, but his death did nothing to stop the blockbuster deal-making of Ludwig Feinberg. There's always somebody that's gonna pop up within the Colombian drug cartels. The men who moved up the ranks within the Medellin cartel were ready to make another deal. They were looking at different methods of transporting drugs from Colombia into the United States. And this was really the first time that they had started to look at submarines. They can go for days underwater without being detected and evading whatever radar we had up at the time. Feinberg tells them, I can probably get you a submarine. Tarzan viewed himself as a trendsetter when it came to drug trafficking. In the mid-1990s, he flew to Kronstadt Naval Base with a Cuban-American fugitive named Nelson Yester. The FBI had a warrant out for him. He was a known drug dealer, and he was hiding out in South America. They meet with the commanding admiral, and Feinberg says, you know, my friends are interested in buying a submarine. The admiral replies and says, with or without warheads. They settled on a 90-foot-long Foxtrot-class attack submarine. They estimated it could carry up to 40 tons of cocaine. Tarzan negotiated a price, $5.7 million, with a cool million coming to him. By the time of the submarine deal, a federal task force had already been focused on Tarzan and his friends at Porky's for years. It's called Operation Odessa. Agents say the nude bar became center stage for a plot that mixed the Russian mob with the Kali cartel and sexual favors with drug conspiracies. It was a combination of DEA, FBI, Coast Guard, City of Miami Beach, Miami Dade Police Department. We got together and I tried to explore getting informants and undercover officers to penetrate the organization. The first rat they targeted was Tarzan's oldest friend, Josip Roises, AKA Gregory. He'd gotten a new nickname by then, the Cannibal. He was arrested several times in New York for various crimes and misdemeanors. And one time he was handcuffed behind his back and three cops were wrestling him and he jumped up at the sergeant and bit the end of his nose off. So ever since then, he's been called the Cannibal. He had no teeth left by the time he went to work for the United States. He was arrested on an Interpol warrant in Bulgaria. And when the cops arrested him, they kicked all of his teeth out, threw him in prison, and told him if he wanted to eat, somebody would have to bring him food. So we sent our agent over to speak with him. And Gregory said, I'll do anything to get out of this hole. Within a few months, he was smiling again, and he was back in business with Tarzan. Tarzan owned a restaurant, Babushka's in North Bay. Great little restaurant up in the north end of town. Some of the best Russian food that I had ever tasted. Tarzan had said if Gregory could bring him 72 grand, he would become a partner in Babushka. So we gave him the 72 grand, and he became a partner. The deal went down in October 1994. The new partner was wired up for sound, and so was the restaurant. There was always a favorite corner booth where all the mobsters from New York would always sit. 
that somebody needed to talk business with Tarzan, they would sit there. So we wired them up. They also sent another agent into the operation who also had a history with Tarzan. Alexander Yosevich had been a kid in Brighton Beach who lived down the street from both the resident gangsters. Alex said, uh, I know Gregory. When I went to summer camp, he was one of the counselors there. Yosevich had grown up to become a U.S. Marine and an undercover agent for the DEA. We set up a scenario whereby Alex Yosevich would walk into Babushka and take his table, you know, order his meal, and Roises would recognize him and introduce him to Tarzan, and that's exactly what happened. They kind of clicked, and then the second meeting, he started bragging. You're recording criminal conversations, and with the Russians, they rambled on, especially when they were drinking. So you had a lot of recorded conversations. And part of the problem was they not only spoke in Russian, but they spoke in Ukraine. They had they spoke in different dialects. It took us a while to figure it out, to listen to the recordings and understand what was being said. They gave Yasevich a special phone to give to Tarzan as a gift and to let him know it was safe to talk business on it. Tarzan immediately started calling everybody, didn't use hardly any other phone. He would hand it out to other gangsters and Babushka or Porky's, they'd be calling New York, they'd be calling overseas, Moscow, St. Pete, wherever. They recorded him talking about the deal of his life. Our agent was so shocked, he didn't know what to do, and we didn't know what to do. I don't doubt he talked to people about acquiring the diesel-era submarines, but was he really going to do it? Was he, could he really do it? Did he have a market to do it? Or was he just being Tarzan? There's a difference between those two things. It wasn't long before everyone in the U.S. government knew the story. NATO, the Department of Defense, everyone knew about it. It was time to bring him in. One of the biggest Hollywood blockbusters of the 1990s was an action mystery about a missing Soviet submarine, The Hunt for Red October. The real-life mystery surrounding a Soviet submarine was solved in 1997, when Ludwig Feinberg was arrested after dropping off his daughter at daycare. As we were driving, he said, what's this all about, you know? And I said, well, you should know. He wouldn't admit to anything. He wouldn't agree to anything, so we put him in jail. I made a surrender two days later, and the rest of the people that were affiliated with some of Tarzan's operations were immediately arrested. He was charged with 30 counts in a massive racketeering case, including conspiracy to smuggle and traffic cocaine. The government's witnesses included Tarzan's childhood friend from the Ukraine, Yosef Gregory Roises, as well as the young undercover DEA informant, Alexander Yosevich. You had a lot of recorded conversations, hours of tapes and videos and surveillances. It was just talk, talk, talk. I mean, the, the Russian military was going to sell six helicopters <laughs> for one, one submarine. It was just ridiculous. I expected when he was presented with the charges and the penalties that he would use common sense and decide that maybe it is time for him to back away and cooperate. They underestimated the will and the resilience of Tarzan. I was one of Ludwig Feinberg, AKA Tarzan's first attorneys. When we went to the bond here, the courtroom was packed. Rows and rows of people came in to refute to explain what had happened. They were there to sort of take care of Tarzan. You know, he had surrounded himself with his employees, his dancers, his bar staff, his security staff. He was like the king of the mountain there. And he acted like uh, he knew he was the king. And they acted accordingly. I was Mr. Framberg's and his business as a civil lawyer. I was so 
surprised, more than surprised, I would almost use the word shocked at the allegations that were made. He never changed. Oh, this will pass, this is all caca, this is gross exaggeration. He spent over two years refusing to talk and went through nine different lawyers. Tarzan spent millions of dollars in attorneys and legal motions that prove futile. He stayed in prison, lost the motions. He was abandoned and ignored by his friends, associates, criminal associates. He could have faced life in prison, but the last minute he did cooperate. I was lead and sole counsel for Mr. Feinberg. I was his ninth attorney. We ended up not going to trial, but making a negotiation with the government. He pleaded guilty to a single count of racketeering and admitted to everything from the sex trafficking to narcotics, the Colombian-Russian relationship, and even the submarine. And then he actually testified against his collaborators. Tarzan took the stand against his former partner, the Cuban dock owner who had posed as Pablo Escobar to save his life, Juan Almeida. Almeida was a drug trafficker. He had connections with the Medellin and Cali cartels. In the eyes of the U.S. government, because of his success smuggling cocaine, Almeida was deemed the bigger fish. Tarzan became the star witness. He did testify, but it's kind of like, you know, if, if a fight is fixed and this guy he wants to show up and show a good fight but not win, that's sort of what Tarzan did. He showed up, he would pretty much tell the truth as we knew it, but then when the defense attorneys would come up, then he would back off from it and he was not really playing the game straight with us. Almeida was convicted. Tarzan was almost immediately deported to Israel. In exchange for Mr. Feinberg's cooperation, he was released 30 days after his uh, sentencing. I was afraid the judge would let Tarzan go with time served, and that's exactly what he did. This was a dry conspiracy. Federal sentencing guidelines are based upon quantities of drugs, and there really never was any cocaine. And that's what starts at how many months and years someone is going to do. And once the judge was convinced that this was a dry conspiracy, the heavy sentence was gone. Ludwig Feinberg spent just over 30 months in prison and was sent to Israel with $1,500 in his pocket, but not before filing a deposition declaring that his entire testimony was a lie. Anybody who thought that he was not bright or a street thug uh, didn't spend much time with him. We had to go through evidence for hours and hours and days and weeks and months and his grasp of the law, his understanding, all showed that he was extremely bright. In 2011, a dozen years after his deportation, Tarzan found himself in a Panamanian jail cell for running a local prostitution ring. Behind bars, he became an internet sensation. In the videos, Mr. Prisoner, as he called himself, appealed to the Russian government to come to his rescue. I know he was deported from a few countries. He's been thrown out of almost every country he's visited since the United States. Today, he's back home where he started. He used to call me from Russia. You know, Brent, it's really tough over here. You know, I'm driving a cab, and I wish I could get back in the US sometime, which was a lie. He was not driving a cab, but whatever. He's not coming back to the United States anytime soon, either. He is not able to re-enter the United States without the written permission of the Attorney General of the United States. And that seems as unlikely as his dream of a submarine filled with cocaine. He was of the opinion that he should be the subject of a big screen movie. He was delusional in nature, but he loved the limelight. And for a criminal, that is a fatal, fatal mistake.